In the meantime, uh, the publication will be as usual in the series of World Scientific, and uh, we are discussing, we have the good fortune to have with us today the owner and his wife, Keke Pois, in first row, uh, with the, uh, uh, Keke Pois and his wife are the owner of uh, World Scientific, and um, we, ah, the chairman is arriving, good. And uh, we will uh, attempt to have, um, in addition to the typical three-volume series, also an uh, electronic version for you to have and uh, uh, go all over uh, at international level. Okay, go. Okay. Sorry, I was late. So we start the next talk by Paolo Giomi. It's very long title, so you read that. Okay, thank you very much. I guess this works. Okay, the title is uh, Long multi wavelength multi messenger astrophysics with blazers uh, um, results and uh, predictions. Uh, I will uh, just uh, go through a very quick introduction about blazers uh, and the distinction between uh, two types of AGN. Normally, people, especially in the high energy, talk about AGN uh, meaning blazers. Uh, in fact, actually, AGN come in two main categories. Those where the, uh, the emission is mostly from the accretion onto a supermassive black hole in the, in the center of the galaxy. And, and uh, these are normally radio quiet. And 90% of the sources are of this type. Only in 10% of the cases you actually get a jet. And uh, in, in, in this case, uh, the, uh, the emission is often dominated by the jet, especially if the jet is, uh, happens to be uh, in the direction of the line of sight. So if you are looking down the jet, uh, we start uh, seeing relativistic motion and uh, uh, relativistic effects. And that makes uh, relativistic amplification, that makes uh, the um, uh, non-thermal emission dominate. Those are called blazers. Blazers, uh, uh, now we know about 3,500, perhaps 4,000 at the moment. Uh, which seems to be a large number. Actually, this is uh, really not so, so large, uh, even though it's increasing rapidly, uh, because the actual uh, uh, number of AGN of the radio quiet uh, type are actually over one million. So blazes are quite rare. Uh, and of course, if you compare with, uh, with the stars and galaxies, which are billions, um, blazes uh, are very, very rare. Uh, nevertheless, they are by far the dominant type of extragalactic sources in some energy bands. In microwave, uh, where they get in the way between us and the NSCMB fluctuation, and they must be removed, uh, and this is an important issue, especially for the next generation of, of uh, 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 detectors. Uh, then, of course, in the gamma ray, between 100 MeV, and probably below 100 MeV, 200 GeV in Fermilat, certainly, demonstrated that, and uh, the very high energy emission energy is above 100 GeV, Fermi and uh, imaging atmospheric Cherenkov telescopes and CTA, of course. So, uh, and uh, perhaps uh, the neutrino sky, we will have a look at that. So, uh, we know that blazers are the site of very high energy phenomena from uh, many, many different observations. We observed uh, photons coming from them up to uh, several TeV. And uh, we have seen uh, uh, actually superluminal motion pointing and making a correction to um, speeds very close to the speed of light. But uh, what do they like? Uh, that depends very much on where you're looking. Uh, if you look in the optical, this is the famous uh, Quasar 3273, it was the first laser to be discovered. It looks just like a, a normal star, that's why it's called. Uh, Quasi-stellar radio source is actually quasi-radio source because it's a very strong radio source. And it's quasi-stellar because if you look very carefully, you see a little jet. But overall, it's, uh, it's, very, it's impossible to distinguish between uh, that and, and a normal star. That is very different if you look into, uh, at the blazer from a different perspective. This is the electromagnetic spectrum all the way from the radio to the gamma rays. And this is, a, again, it's the same object, actually. It's 3C273. 
you see uh, immediately that uh, this object, contrary to the stars which are normally emit in the black body around the optical band, uh, we have emission across the entire electromagnetic spectrum, so from radio all the way to the gamma rays. The other thing that you see immediately is a very large variability, which depends a bit on uh, uh, where you are in the spectrum. In the radio, it's not so much, and then millimeters starts getting maybe a factor of 10 or so, and then it changes a lot. Up to, this is 1 GeV uh, data, with the light curve, you can see it, it, it goes from 10 to the 43 to 10 to the 47. Uh, so 10 to the 47 arcs per second uh, tells you also the amount of energy that comes out is extremely large. Um, not everybody knows that uh, uh, it is actually quite common to see in the gamma rays variability of the factor of the order of 10 to the 4. Uh, now this is the actual blue band. That's, uh, this is the optical band where the, uh, uh, the observations were made to find out that there were uh, redshifted uh, lines. This, uh, uh, perhaps you can see this is the H alpha line. Uh, and this is the so-called blue bump, which dominates, uh, 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 which is uh, the result of infalling of the matter onto, onto the black hole. And uh, the rest of the emission is mostly due to the jet. Okay. Now, as I, uh, so, uh, just, uh, as I just said, the variability is one of the key characteristics of these sources. So a few years ago, we, uh, we thought uh, the best thing to do to characterize these objects is to look at them in a simultaneous way. Uh, there was a time when Planck was, on the, was in the sky operating. We had Swift, uh, we had Fermi, and we organized a, a, a big campaign to observe uh, a number of more than 100 objects uh, simultaneously. When Planck observed the object, Swift pointed at it, and, and Fermi was following. Uh, so uh, with simultaneous data, we can uh, see uh, more or less uh, better actually than before how the uh, emission uh, is across uh, uh, the electromagnetic spectrum. We have the first bump, which is normally called, uh, um, which peaks in this case at around 10 to the 13 hertz, and that makes this object what we call low energy peaked, because this peak is uh, relatively low energy. Um, and this is uh, uh, the emission normally due, attributed to electrons that are moving in a, in, a, in a magnetic field, in relativistic electrons. So synchrotron radiation. And then there is a second bump, normally called the Compton bump, uh, assuming that there is some kind of inverse Compton emission that causes this emission here. As we shall see, maybe this is not the only way of, in, of interpreting this uh, emission here, but it tells you how the, the terminology is biased towards uh, early uh, thinking about these objects. Uh, okay, this is the paper. Another object, uh, which is Macarena Fiber 1, uh, you see the richness of the Swift uh, uh, data here. This is the host galaxy, this is the ultraviolet coming out. In this case, uh, the peak is not at 10 to the 13 like before, but it moved to 10 to the 17 or so. This makes this object uh, an HBL, a high energy peak BLAC. Now, when this synchrotron emission reaches the uh, X rays, then uh, the other bump, let's call it the inverse Compton bump, uh, moves uh, at very high energy, and then uh, uh, emission up to the very high energy band, gamma ray band, uh, is, uh, is observed. So since I will put uh, more emphasis on, in this talk in this energy band, so that's why I'm, I'm talking about that. Now let, let's go back 20 years in time now. Uh, Macarena 421 is another very, very famous object. And this is uh, what it looked like. It's SCD in, uh, back in 1995. Uh, we had data at various frequencies. Uh, we had uh, some satellites. This is uh, Exosat. This is uh, Einstein. This was the Compton uh, Egret experiment. Uh, so we saw that uh, there was that kind of uh, uh, distribution. I didn't plot here the optical, but obviously there is a galaxy here. Uh, we knew that at that time that there is maybe a factor of 10 variability in the X-rays. Now, if we know, if we look what it looks today, you see how, how much multi-frequency data is now available. Uh, all the way from the radio, this is Herschel, uh, Planck, uh, we have uh, Beposax, actually, the yellow stuff is uh, the, the Beposax uh, uh, spectra, which are still, I think, the best. Um, and uh, we have uh, um, Swift XRT and then uh, uh, New Star data, and this is the light curve in the... Uh, uh, from Fermi, and of course we have uh, this object has been detected several times in, in, uh, in the TEV band. Now this uh, this uh, dramatic change uh, is uh, is occurred because there, there's a lot of uh, 
observation has been done meanwhile, but also because there are uh, some tools that allow you to retrieve the data in a very simple way. So uh, and this is a, just an example. Uh, you can use this tool to, to get all the data in a very simple way, uh, making your life uh, very easy to, um, to do multi-frequency uh, studies and multi-temporal studies. Uh, this is an example of uh, how many radio sources, uh, radio catalogs, uh, before we had uh, some, all the, all the uh, X-ray satellites and so on. Okay, so um, let's say the, 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 the typical uh, assumption about uh, blazers were that there, were, there is some synchrotron emission which peaks somewhere, and then you have inverse Compton emission, which makes, uh, makes sense. Uh, it's, it's reasonable. Uh, but is it, given all the data that we have, is that really reasonable or not? Let's concentrate on uh, uh, the 1 kV band, which is uh, represented by this uh, blue point, and the 1 GV band. Well, you see there is a, a variability of a factor of 10. So first of all, if this was uh, just a synchronous of Compton, this should have been a factor quadratic with that. And obviously, this is not. Uh, but if you look at the, at the correlation between the data coming in this at 1 kV and the data coming in 1 GV, uh, which is this one, you do a, cor a correlation function and you see that it's completely flat. There is no correlation between the 1 kV and, and 1 GV. But so, uh, so that means that uh, um, maybe the a simple SSC is not really enough. You need to go uh, uh, trying to understand that this... Uh, object in, in, uh, in a deeper way. Maybe this is a hydraulic emission. Maybe this comes from, uh, from uh, uh, some other uh, component. Maybe it's a multi-component. Multi Certainly, there is a lot of complication. Okay, this is just a light curve. Uh, in the 1 kV band, you see this flare. And this is a, a 1 GV band. And, and this is uh, the ratio. You see that at a certain point, so there was the ratio between the two was at this level. At a certain other point, it changed by a factor of two or so. Uh, but if you concentrate on this flare, which was observed in the X-rays and in, in the gamma ray, then you do the correlation function, you see that uh, during the flare there is correlation. So during the flare, some blob dominated. And uh, this is another way of, uh, of uh, showing the complication of, uh, of, of the beauty of Macarena 4 to 1. If you take all the data that we have and you plot the, the position of the peak in a, 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 of the synchrotron as a function of luminosity, you clearly see that there, there was a period between 2004 and 2007 when the, the peak changed by a factor of maybe 10 to the 3, almost from 0.1 kV to 100 kV, without the luminosity changing so much, maybe a factor of 2 or 3. And then there was another period when, uh, in, after 2007, when uh, the, uh, the increase in, in the energy uh, in the peak is really much more correlated with luminosity, showing that there are some other mechanisms that work there. Okay, so as I said, uh, the... These two uh, components don't talk to each other too much. Nevertheless, they talk to each other, uh, at least in a statistical way. This is a plot coming from uh, the third uh, catalog of uh, AGN from uh, um, Fermi. And you see that clearly there is a correlation between the spectral index in the gamma rays and the, the peak of the synchrotron. So the higher the peak, the flatter the, is the, the, it's the gamma ray uh, emission. So the two peaks talk to each other, but in a complex way. Okay, so this is the most famous uh, uh, object, uh, probably, at least uh, when it was at uh, this, uh, again here, note a factor of 10 to the 4 variability, 10 to the minus 12 in flux up to 10 to the minus 8. When it was at this point, it was the brightest source in the, in the, in the, in the sky. As I have shown you before, the peak, the first peak is at around 10 to the 13 or so. So this is a typical LBL. This is an inverse Compton, perhaps. The, lots of variability everywhere. Uh, and, and we see in this case that most of the variability is in the gamma rays. If we, uh, if we just change the x-axis, uh, and then we have time here, and then we plot the various uh, um, fluxes in the various energy bands from 1 GeV and uh, 1 keV uh, optical and radio, you see that there is a general trend which is similar and much more richness in the gamma rays. Uh, but uh, there are also differences. The, the, the radio is smoothed and clearly arrives later. So uh, you have to take into account of that. If you do the uh, uh, correlation uh, between the, these light curves, you see that uh, only the one millimeter uh, light curve follows the one GV with zero delay. This is a discrete correlation function where the correlation is maximum at zero time lag. But then, even if you take 1 kV, it's, uh, it's delayed by 35 days, one month, 
compared to the Evangev. Uh, and then if you go to the radio, you have two bands at 37 gigahertz and even four bands at uh, uh, one jet. So uh, each energy band reacts in a, in a way that, it, that is peculiar, depending on the type of the object and, uh, and um, on the frequency. Uh, all of this should be taken into account when I'm trying to understand these objects. Uh, one way, uh, so one way of doing this, uh, if I can get this thing started, maybe, okay, I don't know where, it, okay. Okay, one way of showing this very bit is this is playing this as a, as a movie. In this movie, I put 60, more than 60,000 observations. You see how the SED changes with time as, it, as time goes by, as marked by the light curve in the gamma ray. So now this is a synchrotron, it's very high here, and the radio is not falling yet. Here we're close to the very peak of the, everything's very bright, but not so much in the X rays. Uh, you see all the yellowish stuff, uh, uh, the data from uh, uh, satellites, and uh, the green stuff is uh, data from, uh, from ground-based telescopes. So I have put together data from many, many different sources. Uh, uh, often I say that this is the most expensive uh, movie ever, because you have to, if you have to pay for all of these uh, satellites, uh, it will cost you a lot of money. But, it, but it's, uh, uh, on the other hand, it was the cheapest uh, movie because I didn't pay anything. I just uh, I was able to get the data for free. And only by combining the data in this way and maybe using new techniques to extract information, taking into account of the dynamical time scales of different energy bands, you can really extract the, the, the physics, the, the real physical meaning of, of, of this object. Now, we move a little bit of, uh, uh, from, from the direct physics uh, to describe a little, um, a little bit this uh, new view that uh, myself and my colleague Paolo Padovani and, and others have been... Uh, 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 thinking about in the, in the, in the several years uh, uh, ago, and uh, we're still working on that. So we, we, the history of, of lasers uh, is, was complex uh, because of the, of the complication of variability and, uh, and different peaks, uh, and uh, they looked very, very different in radio bands and the X-ray surveys and the gamma ray surveys. We try to understand uh, if we can make sense of all of that. And we think we, we can do that, uh, making uh, a, simplif a very, we try to simplify the view as much as possible. Essentially what we did, we, uh, there is no time to go into details, but uh, we had this uh, Occam's Razor's approach. Can we explain the, uh, roughly well uh, what we see in every energy band? Make a, sim it's a very simple assumption. We, we, the real simple assumption was that there is an engine which accelerate particles, electrons in this case, uh, um, to a certain characteristic uh, energy, which is, uh, uh, in this case, a Lorentz factor of three. But in some cases, more, much more rare, you can accelerate particles uh, uh, up to much higher energies. Now, if you take this simple uh, engine and you put it into the Monte Carlo simulation, you take into account of the uh, uh, luminosity function we measure in the, in the radio and microwave, and you take into account of, uh, of uh, the definitions of blazers uh, and uh, the lacks and, uh, and phosphate radio quasar, and you mix everything into a Monte Carlo simulation, we demonstrated that, that uh, uh, we could uh, explain the different uh, evolutions in the phosphate radio quasar and the lacks. Uh, uh, we explained the, the ratio distribution, which are very different in, uh, in uh, the lacks and the phosphate radio quasar. We explained the distribution of peaks, and this is in a radio simulator survey. The red stuff is a simulation, the, uh, the black histogram is the actual data. Uh, we see that the flash spectral radio quasars, uh, 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 which are the, the blazer, where uh, you can see the, the, the broad lines, whereas in BLX so you don't see any, any, any broad lines. Uh, the distribution are similar, but BLX at a slightly higher peak. And if you go in, in, the, ray, in the x rays, uh, the situation is very different uh, as we knew it. Uh, and that was puzzling for many years. Uh, I think we think we can uh, explain that very simply as a selection effect. In this case, the flow spectral radio quasar are still peaking at around 10 to 13, but uh, the BLX, uh, uh, they peak at much higher uh, uh, energies. Okay, uh, there is no time to go into any detail. But then uh, we, the, from the first uh, paper, we went to a second one because we wanted to explain the gamma ray data. So we used the same machinery. Uh, to, with some uh, correlation between the radio and the gamma rays, uh, 
And uh, uh, in the end, we, we could say in the abstract, a simulation are in remarkable agreement with the overall observational results. Um, the fraction of ratio plus uh, objects, uh, synchrotron peak, gamma ray spectral index, uh, basically uh, all the uh, general uh, um, variables that we normally uh, measure. In particular, in this case, the ratio distribution for plus spectral radio quasar, they should peak at around one. For VLX, uh, they peak at the very low level, very low values. We can reproduce that. The distribution of peaks in the gamma rays, again, that can be uh, very well uh, reproduced. Okay, so that's uh, um, to tell you that uh, we have uh, one simple way of uh, describing a population of blazers and then uh, run simulations and see what they do uh, across the universe and how they uh, radiate in various uh, energy bands. Now, the next topic is uh, uh, something that is going to be uh, published very soon. It's been around within the Fermi uh, team, of which I'm a member. It's the second uh, uh, Fermi high uh, energy uh, catalog. Uh, so the Fermi view of very high energy sky. By high, very high energy, it means uh, 50 GeV to, t to TV, which overlaps uh, with, uh, with uh, the CTA. So uh, we use uh, six years of data using the past eight, a new uh, calibration, a new software. And uh, the, this is the, the sky. You can perhaps see uh, many sources there. You will see them in a better way in a moment. And our uh, simplified view of Blazer, uh, we, uh, Paolo and myself, Paolo Padovani and myself have been working uh, on that simulation to predict uh, the expectation in the energy band to predict the especially the uh, high, high galactic latitude uh, um, survey with the, with the CTA, and we ended up with this uh, expectation here. Uh, this is for energy larger than 100 GeV. If you compare the, uh, the expectation that we did for the 100 GeV, and you take into account of the energy band uh, that in the, the, in the Fermi 2 FHL catalog starts at 50 GeV, we get this uh, matching, and at lower energy, uh, also very good match. So that means that we predicted and we published this paper before the, the, the catalog was uh, uh, assembled. So our prediction reproduced fairly well the high energy sky as seen by Fermi. So we can use our prediction to predict maybe also the ratio distribution and other things uh, uh, to have a preview of what will be seen in, uh, in, uh, with the CTA. Uh, and next, uh, in parallel to all of this, we try to not only to estimate, uh, uh, you know, using Monte Carlo simulations, uh, uh, what would uh, the high energy sky be. Uh, we also uh, selected a sample, of an uh, initial sample, with about 1,000 blazers of the type uh, of HSP, high synchrotron peak blazers, that would uh, radiate uh, in the very high energy band. This, is, uh, this has been published the, uh, earlier this year, and this is the sample. Um, okay, the, the way we did it, uh, we started actually from, uh, as I said before, blazers are very rare. There is a, a, a one, our sample is 1,000, uh, but we started in the, in the infrared uh, where the, the WISE catalog includes 750 million. So we went through all the 750 million uh, infrared objects and we looked for those objects where the infrared spectrum looks like this, and then we looked for sources that not only have an infrared spectrum like this, but they also have radio uh, with a certain slope. And then uh, we looked at the x-rays, uh, and uh, which matches this uh, general shape of HPR sources. And then uh, we measured uh, the uh, SED, and uh, we made sure that uh, the peak was uh, larger than 10 to the 15 hertz, which is uh, the definition of a high-energy peak blazer. So we, we went through this. Uh, um, and we have a sample of about 1,000 uh, sources uh, of that type. Now, if we use this sample and uh, we, you, do, uh, you plot this histogram like this, this is just the intensity at this level, the, the peak intensity, in this case, is just below 10 to the minus 11. That's, that's the, the intensity of the peak for the sample that uh, has been detected uh, already by the uh, existing imaging Cherenkov uh, telescopes. Um, now, you see that the very bright ones, 100% uh, have been detected. As you go down, uh, still 100%, and then at a certain point, only 60%, and, and then 17% only have been detected. And this is the current, uh, roughly, 
uh, image of a very certain of sensitivity limit. It knows that only 17% of these objects have been, have been detected. So many others, we know where they are, and they could be probably detected by the current generation of the of Cherenkov telescopes. Of course, as we heard before, in the near future, we'll go down by, by a factor of 10, and uh, we will open uh, this um, discovery space for these objects, and you see there will be hundreds of sources across the, uh, on, the, on the sky. The exagalactic survey at CTA will only cover a quarter of the sky, so you should divide this by roughly by a factor of four or so. Uh, this is the exagalactic, this is the limit of a CTA. The exagalactic survey will probably be uh, uh, at this level. Okay, so um, very soon, we, this is today, this is the, we have seen it uh, maybe in a better representation before, the, the sky at very high energy. Um, uh, from the TEFCAT, and uh, it's essentially today. Uh, this is uh, what will happen tomorrow when uh, the, the, the 2FHL catalog uh, is uh, released. Uh, and you can see many of the objects uh, uh, are the same, but there are many others that uh, uh, will, uh, have been detected, but uh, they have not been uh, detected by Cherenkov telescopes yet. Now, if we want to go further, then we, we use our sample, the WHSP, for the bright sources, you see again, there are many more sources, uh, and these sources, we know where they are, they are these are known blazers. Some of those have been detected by uh, Fermi, some others have not been detected. There are also some other sources detected by Fermi, but not uh, in our sample. And that is because these objects, uh, they don't have the peak at uh, uh, so high energy above 10 to the 15, which means that uh, uh, our, our Sources only cover, we made an estimate, about 60% of our sources are here, of the real sources detected, that are detectable are here. 40% will, are not here, are not in our sample because we stopped at 10 to the 15. Now, this is if, if we consider the bright sample. If we, can, if we go down and we move, uh, bright sample means that in principle all these sources could be detectable by the current generation of Cherenkov telescopes. If you go down by a factor of 10, and uh, the, the CTA uh, will likely and uh, uh, potentially observe uh, and detect all of these sources. And uh, this is an extension of the, from the one WHSP to the two WHSP. Uh, we moved down to, from 20 degrees to 10 degrees, and so we expanded. So uh, this is to show you uh, the kind of a preview of what the gamma ray sky will look in a, in a few years' time. Uh, and this is not just a prediction, we know also the, the objects and the redshift and so on. Okay, now uh, we want to push the higher energies, as I said before, and uh, we want to see what we can say about uh, uh, neutrinos. Uh, uh, blazers have always been considered, at least since a long time, possible sources of neutrinos. There was a, a, a paper by Padovani and Resconi uh, uh, published last year, and also the uh, about uh, high energy peak blazers, uh, some other people, uh, the Tanami uh, 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 people, have been looking at the possibility of having neutrinos from uh, L LBL blazers, and you know, those peaking at lower energies. Uh, so th this is a possibility. And then uh, uh, there was this uh, mo model of uh, generating gamma rays uh, in, uh, in BLLAX uh, through photohadronic uh, uh, processes. Uh, uh, which would result in the production of neutrinos. Um, so this was the theory behind that, and then uh, uh, we applied this theory, this model, to our uh, Monte Carlo simulation, since uh, uh, we know the gamma rays, so the, very quickly, uh, the model is you have some electrons that we know, and uh, we, we assume that there are protons which are accelerated by, who knows, some mechanism. Uh, these are injected isotropically into a blob in, in a constant rate, uh, and then it, they interact with magnetic field and produce secondaries. Uh, in the end, uh, you have five uh, stable particle population protons, which lose energy by synchrotron, beta height process, but also uh, photopion interactions. In this case, uh, okay, uh, and in that case, uh, you get the, the, the neutrinos. Electrons lose energy by synchrotron very quickly in this content. Photons gain and lose energies in various ways. And neutrons just go out and neutrinos the same. So taking into account of all of this mixture, uh, you can uh, 
um, calculate the, uh, the relationship between the gamma ray emission and uh, the uh, neutrino emission. This was done, and then uh, we plugged this uh, model into the simplified view machine, for which we know the, um, the distribution of, of blazers uh, across the universe, uh, the, the redshift distributions, uh, and everything. And the result uh, is that uh, you can uh, predict the neutrino spectra by, uh, in this way. You have a constant uh, here, uh, which is a, actually the ratio between the, neu the neutrino luminosity and the gamma ray luminosity, uh, which is related by the, by the gamma ray flux, which we can predict. And we showed before that uh, our prediction agreed very well with the, with the, with the, the observation with Fermi. And uh, then you take into account the ray shift, you take into account the dead adopter factor and, uh, and the synchrotron peak. All of these variables we know because we simulate those. And then uh, uh, we plug in, uh, of course, luminosity function and everything. In the end, you can calculate uh, the integrated emission from neutrinos and you can plot it against uh, the observations. So in this case, these are, this is a PV scale, energy scale, and this is the... Uh, uh, intensity times uh, uh, e square, and these are the ice cube neutrinos. Um, the, our predictions uh, are uh, like this, at about maybe at around one PV, uh, our prediction is more or less right, but below one PV, uh, we don't expect any, any uh, substantial emission of, of uh, uh, neutrinos. So uh, if we are right, and uh, uh, these are coming from extragalactic sources. There should be some other population of extragalactic sources uh, uh, doing the low energy neutrinos. Uh, at higher energy, there are no detections uh, so far, so we'll have to wait for new observations in the future. Now, if we, if we uh, then uh, try to have the, uh, the, big, the big picture where we put together the uh, uh, gamma ray um, background, uh, this is the Fermi background. Uh, this is uh, uh, our prediction for all blazers, the blazer simplified view. This is uh, at the beginning. We don't, pre we don't predict 100%, but maybe 50%, depending on the energy. But uh, at above uh, an energy of a few GeV, then we predict 100%. And from this 100% of, uh, of the gamma rays, then we estimated the, the, uh, the neutrino. And this is the uncertainty band. So um, this is our prediction. We'll see. With the, of course, we need, in this case, we need uh, more uh, neutrinos, more observations uh, to test if this is uh, reasonable. Of course, uh, uh, many people have shown already that uh, there is no direct uh, uh, association of, uh, of, uh, of or at least very strong association between uh, lasers and, and uh, neutrinos, although in the paper, Padovani uh, Rescone showed that there is a, a, a small, um, a significant signal anyway. Uh, clearly, more data are clearly necessary. Um, of course, if this is true, then uh, all, uh, we will have to rethink uh, the models and take into account also the, uh, that uh, at least part of the gamma ray emission is due to the, uh, some hydronic process. Okay, let's go to even higher energies and uh, uh, ultra-high energy and HSP blazers. And uh, this is uh, just a... Uh, um, a plot of the, in the galactic coordinates of, uh, um, say, the most famous uh, ultra-high energy cosmic rays coming from the telescope array and from Auger, uh, overlaid, or we'd also plotted on uh, the, our uh, sample of uh, HSP blazers with figure of merit larger than one, the bright ones. Uh, as you can see, there's a, uh, a lot of uh, uh, sources around and a few matches. Not so many. Uh, this is a, a, a Centaurus A region, as uh, it was shown before. It's, uh, it's a busy region in terms of also ultra energy cosmic rays, but there are also uh, a couple of um, very bright uh, uh, HSP blazers there. So, uh, um, so there is a certain possibility, but there are also other blazers can be a possibility and they just happen to be there. Now, uh, are these uh, uh, associations significant? Uh, the answer you know already, uh, no, uh, but uh, we've, we've done, we tried many times. Uh, this is a, the expectation of the number of matches. We started from 78 candidates, uh, counterparts from uh, bright uh, objects. So if we had a, a perfect matching, we would have a signal up here 70. This is the expectation as a function of radius, uh, simply based on, on uh, 
on uh, geometrical uh, uh, considerations, uh, and this is the result. Uh, the, the red points and the, the green points are, are just uh, uh, um, some uh, Monte Carlo measurements uh, to make sure that uh, we understand what we are doing, that these are the expectations based on the Monte Carlo, and this is just a, 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 a theoretical formula. So the expectations for the theoretical formula are just the same as the Monte Carlo and, and another technique, which is the shifting of the, of the sky. And this is the result of the, of, the, of the matching. You see, it's fairly disappointing. There are a few sources of the order of maybe 10 or 15, but it's not enough to go above the green line, which is a two sigma away from the, the expectation of the red line. Uh, still, it is a little bit higher. If you go to a higher uh, radii, you see that uh, the, the matching is uh, of this type. So I don't know if that, whether this is really some signal of, uh, of uh, something being there. If it is there, it is of the order of uh, maybe an excess of three or four or five objects, maybe 10, if you, if you take into account of the error. Certainly, there is no one-to-one -one match uh, between ultra-high energy cosmic rays and, uh, and blazers of the type that I've shown you before, that are the ones where the peak is the high energy and then they emit gamma rays, and they are, uh, by definition, the objects where the acceleration gets uh, to the higher energies. So, um, conclusions. Uh, uh, um, lasers were uh, considered, when I started working on lasers uh, many years ago, in the 1880s, uh, uh, there were only a few of them, and uh, it was a topic of a few specialists. But for some reason, mostly Italians, who knows why. Uh, now, uh, blazers are still becoming central to, to a number of uh, uh, um, energy bands, like uh, a very high energy band, and uh, perhaps uh, they could help in opening the window, the multi-message uh, window, uh, astrophysics window. The behavior in terms of population studies, statistical distribution, we think we understand it fairly well, and the predictions for future surveys are fairly robust, in my view. Uh, on the other hand, despite the rapid growth of multi-frequency data, the details of the physical mechanism behind the emission of blazer uh, are not understood completely, and may maybe we need to go to a, a next uh, generation of models. So certainly more theoretical work and new software tools, probably, because we're probably um, data swamped rather than, uh, than uh, 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 data start. So we need uh, new software tools to get the data, but also to interpret the data. Uh, and finally, BLAX are excellent and probable candidates for ice cube neutrinos, both from the observational and theoretical point of view. BLAX could explain the high energy above 0.5 or 1 PeV, part of the ice cube diffuse emission. A different population was instead needed at lower energies. Uh, um, and although a few BLAX could be within the sensitivity of the, of the ice cube. Um, so the scenario is testable with S cube if we detect uh, um, events larger than 2 PV, and uh, of course if there is a better association between point sources and uh, and the neutrinos. And with this, thank you, thank you very much.